Hello, Alabama fans, and welcome, welcome to the Bama Online Big Show. I'm Tim Watts, the publisher of Bama Online, and with me is Charlie Potter, team extraordinaire, our cover guy who's fresh off a basketball game last night. You do in preparation for his trip to Baton Rouge. The BOL Big Show is the only show you get all the Bama Online staff. That's Charlie Potter, who does a great job with team. Blake Byler, who's his uh, Robin to his Batman, new young guy that comes in and works with us, is a big basketball fan. We also have Jimmy Stein, Super Bama fan. We have Andrew Bone, who's been doing this 20 years, covering recruiting, and Joseph Hastings, who covers recruiting. So there's six of us, and this is the only show you get all six of our faces. I don't know if that's good. I would guess maybe it's not, but this is the one show. Charlie Potter, it's LSU week. What's that mean for you? Just give me some thoughts. I mean, first of all, let me preface with, I expected this to be a big game, but I expected them, both of them to possibly be seven and one. I think that's fair. Um, I, I think a lot of us thought that maybe six and two was a realistic expectation for Alabama in the first year under Cato and DeBoer. Going into this one, I don't know if we would have guessed that they had beaten Georgia and lost to Vanderbilt. I think we yeah. talked about that. <laughs> that horse is dead. We've beaten that horse to death. To but death. Um, no, I thought this was always going to be a big game, especially with it being on the road. Um, you know, this stretch between Tennessee, Missouri, and and LSU always kind of stuck out to me on the schedule. Um, Missouri's ended up being not great, and they've been banged up. That's that's kind of unfortunate for the Tigers. But um, you know, LSU is it's going to be a tough game. They've got a a high-powered offense, which says a lot because they lost a lot from last year's team. We see what Jaden Daniels is doing in the NFL for the Commanders. Uh, but, you know, they've they've got a, a good quarterback. They do some good things well. I think they have some holes, kind of like Alabama does. So this one, um, it when this week rolls around in the schedule, uh, it really feels like a month because you have the bye week before. And usually these games, there's a lot on the line. There's These are two teams with NFL-laden rosters. And so it's a situation where – this one usually feels like it's for all the marbles, but this year more so than than any other because I don't think the team that, that loses this game has a shot at the playoff. You know, I think when I start when I started with the seven and one, I think if you look at takeaway, we didn't expect the USC loss, or I didn't. You didn't expect the Vanderbilt loss. This could easily be seven and one team. Still a lot on the line because you lose two games this late, they're going to wonder if you're still in probably. I think, but to get to go to Baton Rouge where Alabama's had some success, mm -hmm. um, last game they lost there was just an epic, you know, just an unbelievable battle. The game in, in Tuscaloosa last year was fantastic until Daniels left. I mean, the history there has been rewritten, but Bama was up two scores uh, when he left. But like you said, they lost so much talent. To see LSU have another good offense, I mean, it wasn't just Jaden Daniels. It was Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas. They had some just unbelievable skill players. To put a pretty good offense on the on the table um, for this year has been a you know a, you know feather in the hat for Brian Kelly, no doubt. And yeah, I mean the seven and one thing. Um, I think you could look at it a lot of different ways with Alabama. I think they could be seven and one. They could be eight and zero, or they could be six and or five and three going into this game the way they played against South Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, they, I think this one for the LSU game. Um, it's a situation where I think the offense um, did some better things in the last time out against Missouri. I think Jalen, you could tell they're trying to get him more confident and comfortable. Um, but I think we need to see more from the offense in this one. But the defense has to feel pretty good going into this one as well. But it's going to be a tough challenge against Nussmeyer, who's been really good this year. Um, yeah, I think they saw what Texas A&M was able to do from a pressure standpoint to force them into some bad throws. That can be advantageous because this defense has been very, um, very prone to, to force those turnovers. They have 10 in the last three games. So I, I think with this matchup, I think that LSU has some some firepower, whether it's from the passing game or from an edge rushing standpoint, but they can also be had in other ways. We saw what AM was able to do to them. So it's a it's a fascinating matchup and it's one that um I think like you said, I think Brian Kelly deserves a lot of credit to have this team where they are and still in contention for a playoff spot given everything they lost, not only from the draft, but you have Emory, who's a talented running back out for the season. Harold Perkins was one of the best defensive players in the country. He's out for the season. So for them to be in this spot, I think says a lot about their talent and, and really what they've been able to do from a coaching staff standpoint. 
Now, I was talking to our LSU publisher, Shay Dixon, and he said y'all were exchanging injury reports, and he sent you a pretty good player who's out for LSU. Then you sent him back Cole Adams. He said he had to Google. He's like, who? <laughs> he, and he said, Charlie, this is not even. So tell us about LSU's missing a pretty big cog on that offensive line. Yeah, they're starting left guard. And hey, look, let's not let's not dunk on Cole Adams. I think he's been no, a good player Shea, for Alabama. He Shea just <laughs> isn't well, let's be honest, he hasn't played a lot this year, so Shea wouldn't necessarily have noticed him. Yeah. It it has been a little uh jarring because uh the offensive lineman for LSU is Garrett Dellinger. And anytime I see anything related to LSU, I think of Ross Dellinger, who works for Sports Illustrated, who's a great national writer, and I just kind of think, what is this about? But then it, right. it's it's also funny too, because like uh, I was talking about it with someone at the uh, Mount Moore building uh, earlier this week, and you know, he had tightrope surgery, uh, Dellinger did. And it feels like we've talked about that tightrope procedure so much going into this game where an Alabama player will you know, hurt their ankle against Tennessee, and then they're ready to roll by the time the game in Baton Rouge or Tuscaloosa rolls around. So uh, it hasn't been quite as quick of a turnaround. I know, it, you know it's a situation where it sounds like he just had it, uh, so he's going to miss some time, but that's an offensive line that has some some dudes uh, in terms of their tackle positions. But it'll lose a starter in the interior before you know facing an Alabama team that's kind of trending upward from a defensive standpoint. That's that's never ideal. Uh, but yeah, from Alabama standpoint, I think the the Cole Adams thing is indicative that they're pretty healthy going into this one. Um, you know, it sucks that you lose a guy that has. Uh, been he started a game you know, he's kind of first one off the bench from a wide receiver standpoint but then it affects your punt return as well I think we'll see a lot of Jalen and Bakaway and Ryan Williams back there and that's something to keep an eye on with two true freshmen you know fielding and, and catching punts on the road in Baton Rouge yeah I don't think those two lack for confidence Charlie the one no. thing is I was going to ask you I, I was going to ask you this before we started the show what are you doing travel wise? Are you monitoring this storm? I mean, I'm getting texts now saying it could change it. I know, um, I know those things turn on a dime. What's your status right now as far as you know the travel, or what are your plans for this week? Well, uh, we're gonna stay in town on Friday night and cover the basketball game. Alabama plays Arkansas State on Friday night at seven. Uh, Brian Hodgson coming back into town for a second year in a row, and then planning to get up early and, and drive down to Baton Rouge. So we'll watch it, but I mean. I don't think they're going to move this game to Tuscaloosa or anything like that. I think the people in gold and purple would probably riot <laughs> to not have this game in Baton Rouge. But, yeah, storms down there, you always have to pay attention to it. So it's in the back of your mind. But right now, um, you know, I got to get through Tuesday first, man. Like this is a yeah. loaded week with this, with – uh, basketball, uh, hell, you got the election, you got everything going on. You get the playoff rankings coming out tonight. There's so much that, um, thinking about Saturday right now feels like three months away. <laughs> That's fair. Um, tell us about some of your experiences in Baton Rouge, covering it from the media standpoint. I know they have boisterous fans. I love their fan base. It's a passionate fan base. I see it when I go to Saints games. It reminds me of the SEC. You know, I think there's just probably a little drunker and more beads involved here. But what's been your experience covering games, uh, covering Alabama and Baton Rouge? It's been a lot of fun. Um, really, I've only ever covered one loss there, and that was the last time Alabama went to Baton Rouge in 2022. So, um, you know, Nick Saban and, and that staff did a good job of playing well on the road in that series. Um, yeah, I, th I think the one that sticks out to me the most is probably my first trip down there is 2014 when – you had the overtime win with Blake Sims and throwing the touchdown yeah. pass to DeAndre White. That one kind of sticks with me the most. Um, you know, they're always just battles. It's amazing that you look down there and see the talent that's on the field that you, know, you look a year or two down the road and those guys are going to be starters in the NFL. So it's it's always fun. The, that fan base is loud. I love that their press box is open so you can actually feel the environment because uh, it's, it's you know, I, look, I'll say this. Brian Denny has a good press box. Brian Denny has a good atmosphere um, that's so familiar to you that you like it. Um, and it's hard not to because whenever they get loud, they get loud. But going down to, to Baton Rouge at night, it's a different it's a different animal. And I think that having been um, you know on the road in Knoxville can prepare some of these new guys for that. But it's still going to be tough. The crowd noise is going to be important uh, to handle. Like we saw that they didn't really handle that early and sometimes often against Tennessee. So. Uh, those fans, they have all day to get ready uh, for that game. I think we understand what that means, and, and they'll be they'll be ready for it. But it's a lot of fun. I mean, everything that comes with it, whether it's calling Baton Rouge or them, them playing neck in the stadium, it's it's different. And uh, I think that most most 
guys that go there from a, a beat writer standpoint and enjoy it a lot because not only can you take in that environment, but you get Baton Rouge, you get New Orleans. It's it's a hell of a weekend for sure. I'm excited because it lets you know what this team is one way or the other. Is it a legit playoff type team or is it a team that's rebuilding and focusing towards the next year? I mean, there's been nothing but speculation. And you know, as well as anybody, the season is such a roller coaster. The emotional highs of after South Florida, if Georgia's going to beat the brakes off us. Then you beat the, you know, you beat Georgia and you're, you know, you don't need, you ignore Vandy and get beat. You know, you struggle, you overreact. South Carolina's terrible. You never should struggle. They turn out to be a pretty damn good football team. Vanderbilt's going to end up in the playoffs. I'm not saying Bama shouldn't win those games, but really exciting to see this because it's all the marbles in a lot of ways. Yeah, I don't think Vanderbilt's going to end up in the playoffs, but um, I'm I do. Oh, <laughs> they I think they are. Whoa. They think they are. <laughs> Hot take. But, yeah, hey, you never know. The season's been wild. People lose left and right. <laughs> All right, we got Charlie Potter's froze on us. He's going to love that face. We're going to bring in Blake Byler till Charlie gets un- – Blake, take a picture of that. I mean, That's Charlie – that Charlie is <laughs> – that's the exact look Charlie gives when I text him something. That's the exact look on his face. Right. Well, welcome in Blake Byler. We'll get Charlie here squared away. Um, we'll take that off because that's uh, he'll be mad. At it. <laughs> Blake, welcome to the show. Um, uh, welcome to the show. That was unexpected, but tell us a little bit. We're going. Have you been to Baton Rouge yet to cover a game? I've not covered a game, but I've been to Baton Rouge before. I went to the 2022 game. I didn't cover it, but I got some but friends you were there. who were still in college. Uh, we bought tickets and drove down to that game. First time I'd ever been to Tiger Stadium, and it immediately jumped to the top two stadiums yeah. I've ever been in. Just with It was a night game, obviously, because I think ESPN carried that game. I don't think CBS picked it up for their 230 slot. Um, and ju- just the, the passion and the energy – of the fans in that stadium, how loud it got. Like, it, I don't know if it's been topped since then. And in fairness, I spend a lot of games in press boxes and not actually out in the stands where you can really feel um, the energy and the the volume and everything. But I, I love Tiger Stadium. Like, just the experience. The one experience that I had there, it was unfortunate to see a loss, but um, the the atmosphere and everything was, was top notch, not just in the SEC, but in all of college football. Yeah, I think it's good. And this is a good rivalry considering, you know, the the back and forth. And the, I think to me, what I love the most about it, and we'll have Jimmy Stein on later in the show, and he'll agree, I think we'll all agree, is the talent that's in these friggin' games. I mean, last year alone, you had, you know, you had, uh, you know, Neighbors, Daniels, and Brian Thomas for LSU, three first round picks. or And then you had Alabama with three or four first round picks and Kool Aid out there. Um, all right, welcome back, Charlie Potter. We got him back, Charlie. Do not go back and look how you froze. That was a so I waited to do this till Charlie's back. We got one Whataburger commercial oh, to read no. real quick. <laughs> that I was gonna do sign out. I was gonna do it while you were gone, but I'm like, I'm gonna kick it while he's Blake, down. I'll say this though. Blake saw me last night. I don't know if it's something on my computer. When I was trying to like transcribe Nate, it was like my computer started glitching on me. And then just then mm. I really thought that I got electrocuted. I texted you that, but I was like, well, this is it. This is this is how we go out. Uh, and, you know, and when you see how your face froze, that would have been the last way the world saw you. You'd have been really mad when you were dead. So okay. let me do this commercial. Hey, football fans, whether you're cheering on the Tigers or Crimson Tide on November 9th, plan for a pit stop at the Whataburger food truck during your tailgate. Get ready to watch your team by securing an easy W first with a hot, fresh Whataburger, that is. And no matter who comes out on top, When you take your team to Whataburger, you know you'll feel like a winner. By getting your food made your way fresh and hot every time, 24-7. See you at the game and see you at Whataburger. Now, they will have a a, uh, a food truck outside the the stadium if you two want to go by. I know Shea Dixon, our LSU guy. They've been traveling around the SEC a little bit. So, again, Blake, I don't think we've got your official opinion on Whataburger. Not that this is continuing the commercial, but me. You do? Okay. Okay. We haven't asked you. Yeah. 22, drunk most of the time. I figured you like Whataburger, <laughs> Crystal, and Taco Bell. Hey, and five, you've five heard the story of us trying to go to that Whataburger after the uh, It was great. The unbelievable. Unbelievable. Basketball game. Here we yeah. Are. That was unbelievable. Speaking of the basketball game, before we get into some more football, not a bad start to the season last night, Charlie Potter. 
No, it was not at all. And uh, I think it was kind of a little bit surprising the way that Alabama won that game because you think about it, Alabama has been known for just jacking up a ton of threes. I think they had nearly 50 in uh, the exhibition against Wake Forest, and they only attempted 18. They made eight, and they scored 110 points. Uh, very efficient inside the paint. Uh, what was it, Blake? It was like 58 to 10 or 56-18. Yeah, 56-18. And uh, that's how they had, how much they outscored UNC Asheville in the paint by. So just a dominant performance. I think they were strong on the glass. We saw guys blocking shots. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, I think that it was uh, definitely a, a good um, you know bounce back from a tough Memphis game to watch. Uh, definitely not as many fouls as we saw up in Huntsville. But um, you know, I think probably the only the glaring. Um, problem that Alabama had was they weren't great at the free throw line. Everything else was really solid. Um, you know, they had guys that um, were just dominant in the paint. I think you saw what Cliff can bring to this um, his team. Uh, I think everybody knew what he could do offensively, but or defensively, but from an offensive standpoint, when he and Grant Nelson are on the floor, that's just a ton of fun to watch. So, yeah, an encouraging first start. Um, yeah, I know UNC Asheville is a team that's probably been through a lot here lately. Yeah. The storms up where they're from. But anytime you can hang 110 points on the team and, and do what they were able to do against some athletic-looking dudes uh, in the Bulldogs, uh, I think it's a really impressive start, no doubt. Tell you what's absurd to me, looking back at the box scores, nobody had double-digit shots. In fact, only Mo D had nine shots to even get close to that level. And also, I was really, you know, one of the things I was watching, every all the top ten guys had an assist, a rebound, and a basket. Very even. I mean, again, Mark Sears, did y'all know how many Mark did and had until they basically announced it? Like, did you notice that, Blake? Mark is so quiet with what he does. You're almost thinking – why is Mark not shooting? Why is Mark not scoring? Then they go 19, he hits a free throw and comes out of the game. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I looked at Charlie about halfway through the second half, and I was like, oh, Mark has 18. Like, I didn't even realize because he so did it on so few shots. And I mean, at the end of the game, he had 20 on six of eight shooting. Like, that's 75%. It, it's pretty ridiculous how effortless the game comes to him, uh, especially when you're playing – a lesser team and he has so many talented guys around him like he can just pick his spots and score at ease uh and, and it's it's like nothing even happened I think we're gonna find ourselves taking him for granted a lot this season because of how effortless it is for him and it doesn't look like he's just taking over the game he's just going out there and doing his thing and getting 20 uh probably every time like I wouldn't be shocked if he averaged 20 again just with how efficient he is scoring the basketball um, it's incredible. Like there's a reason that he's a national player of the year candidate and that he might be the best player in college basketball. And that's it right there. Yeah. I mean, you look at this team, I mean, there's not, I mean, we could talk, we don't have to do our own show every couple of weeks to talk about this group, I'm guessing, but I mean, everybody kind of stood out last night. You know, the one thing I've noticed a lot about this team is last night with the interview you posted, Charlie, talking to the players, nobody really asked LeBaron anything. They kept going to Cliff and Trelly. And then when they did a group, any of you guys can answer, they all deferred to LeBaron to let him get his quote in. I think they're aware of that. If you look at the bench, I was really watching the bench closely because we had you know pretty big news with Houston, Mallette, and Nas Cunningham um, redshirting. They were in the game. They were pumped up, especially Nas. He was pointing fingers and all. Um, obviously still excited to be there because you kind of work looking, I think, to see – because they're talented. This isn't <laughs> this isn't your normal this isn't your normal red shirt, Charlie Potter. No, it, it's not. And I think that's kind of the the vibe we've gotten from the entire team is that they like to play with each other. Uh, it's a situation where they they've carried over that Mudita phrase that they adopted from uh, Patrick Murphy and the softball team, and uh, that's vicarious joy through other people's success. And you can see that very early on. We saw it during the exhibitions. And I think, like you said, the most um, the most ideal you know picture of that for this team is the guys that are now redshirting. Uh, were on the bench and they were celebrating. And, you know, Nate talked about it after the game with, with Houston. He wasn't really able to do much this summer. So he's a guy that could really help them out next year because you lose Mark, you lose Trelly, you lose Grant, you lose Chris Youngblood, you lose Cliff, because they're all fifth-year guys in their last year of eligibility. To be able to have him come back for a fifth year would be huge for next year's team, and it would give him a full uh, offseason and a full year to learn the system. 
and he could be you know, really lethal for Alabama next year. And with Nas Cunningham, you can tell just by looking at him, he needs to add some weight uh, to be a more physical player. Um, you know, I think what we saw from Jaron Stevenson last night, the physicality and the aggressiveness that he played with is indicative of just how much time in this system, uh, in this program can benefit a player. So uh, I think the two red shirts make sense, but to see them celebrate their teammates the way that they did, um, of course, you know, they won, you know, by 50 plus, but for them to do that, uh, throughout the game, start to finish. And especially when Max Sharnowski, the walk-on guy in the game and did what he did. I yeah. think it says a lot about just the team mindset. Blake, you know, we text about this, but I felt 25 and a half points is kind of disrespectful for Alabama. Not, I mean, I thought, I mean, I was looking at the other point spreads for the other teams playing similar opponents. Um, even with the ESPN's odds coming out, Bama, I think was fourth. I think the with the betting odds of winning the national championship had UConn up there. Of course, that's a betting deal. But a um, little bit to see that team come out and double that point spread, do it in easy fashion at times. I mean, they had eight turnovers in the first half and only two in the second half. So I thought the second half, even free throw shooting was better than the first. Yeah, I thought they, they definitely played better, but I didn't even think they played like a perfect game or anything. And that's crazy to say because they scored 110 points and won by 50, whatever it was. Like that, it 56. Like it, it's crazy to think. I, I thought there were a bunch of like freshmen made a ton of mistakes. I thought LeBaron Bailon had four turnovers and led the team. I thought Darion Reed had a couple. Um, he had a bad pass. I think Aiden Shirell and Mark Sears had a miscommunication on a roll where Mark threw it into traffic and, and Aiden didn't know he was supposed to roll there. Like there's still a lot of kind of glaring issues where uh, these guys are still new and they haven't played together a whole lot. And so there's going to be uh, miscommunications and things like that that are going to get better over the course of the season. But it, it's it's crazy to think that you had all of these things, free throw shooting, they left a ton of points on the board, turnovers, like all of these things that weren't necessarily up to par certainly not with what Nate Oates wants them to do and they still scored 110 points won by 56 and they were missing Chris Youngblood who might be a top three player on this team it's just like the more and more you think about it the more ridiculous it gets with how loaded this team is uh combined with the performance that they put on and the margin that they were able to win by Grant was a little rusty you know, he had a yeah. couple of he had he had a pass that was very ill advised, but nothing we didn't expect with not being able to get on the floor and play. And before we get out of here and bring in Jimmy Stein, you guys give me a, and later in the week they're gonna the guys Jimmy Stein, Charlie Potter, Blake Byler will have the LSU preview show. It's always a good read getting their opinions of what Bama does need to do and what they're going to try to avoid to do, you know, to, to get this big win. Give me one thing, just one that you're keying on something that's very important in your opinion, going into this game for Alabama. I think we need to see Jalen Milrow use his legs more. I think that the blueprints there from what Texas A&M was able to do uh, offensively against, um, I guess LSU, and we saw what happened last year. Jalen had a career high on the ground, and Alabama was able to win that game against the Tigers. So I don't think it just needs to be the bread and butter, but I think we need to see Jalen Milrow coming off a of bye week kind of attack like he did at the beginning of the Georgia game. If they can do that, if they can kind of replicate that secret sauce that they had coming off of the, the Wisconsin game and the bye week going into the Georgia game, then Alabama can walk out of Baton Rouge with a win. So I think just getting back to that approach uh, offensively, because I think defensively, again, they're trending in the right direction. But offensively, if they can continue to run the ball like they did in the last game and get Jalen Milrow involved in that, that might open some things up for that explosive passing game that hasn't been there the last couple games. So I think getting that that kind of full head of steam with, with Jalen Milrow and, and using his legs and using what he does well, uh, I think that could be really advantageous for this Alabama team. Blake, hit us with something. I'll go to the defensive side. I think it's really important for them to be able to take the ball off of Garrett Nussmeyer. And Ken Womack talked about it yesterday. He's a really aggressive quarterback. Um, and he'll take a lot of shots and a lot of shots he'll hit, but there are times where um, he's been prone to turn the ball over a little bit. And we even saw that in their game uh, two weeks ago, I think it was against uh, Texas A&M. But um, if, I mean, Alabama has been really good taking the ball away the last couple of games. I think they have 10 turnovers in their last three games, if I'm not mistaken. A lot of those have been interceptions. Um, and when you're going into a road environment, 
you want to do things that swing the momentum in your favor and not let the crowd get into it. So um, if they're able to have an interception or two on Garrett Nussmeyer, steal a drive, get some favorable field position, uh, that's going to be really beneficial against a hostile, uh, in a hostile environment against a really good team. And I think that's um, definitely one key to help them get out of Baton Rouge for the win. Yeah, I think pressure in the quarterback. I think that's got to be – you can't leave him sitting back there playing five Mississippi rush. He's too good. He's got some crazy good wide receivers. He's got good tackles. You got to wait. You got to You got to move his feet. You got to get him a little bit off platform, make him do those those small things to make that throw a lot, a lot tougher than it normally is. Charlie Potter and Blake Byler, you can catch them at BamOnline.com. They're on the message board. They're giving opinions. They're giving hot takes. They're dressing up for Halloween. They're still young enough to do that, so – Got Blake, you don't look like you dressed up. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I, I saw the look on your face. Cr- I watched football on Halloween. <laughs> Charlie Sorry, Potter. What, what tra- yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> each his own. You you get that Saturday <laughs> off, you better make the most of it. Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> Especially when you're married. You, hey, let's be honest. When you're married, you're not making these decisions. Stop nope. playing. Nope. All right, guys. We'll see you soon. See you on the round table. See you guys. Jimmy's ground control to major Tom. Every time I see those headphones, I go straight to the to the aviator. I don't know who lands the plane. Like but yeah, Jimmy like Stein, we're here. A lot of freaking. We're we're late in the season. Very late. You know, it's a a must win football game. You got basketball starting up. You got you know the NBA's going. Major League Baseball's over. We are in the middle of the sports heart of the sports world. Um. Let's touch on the LSU game a little bit. Sure. I don't want to get too much of you, your guys' stuff gone. You heard me and Charlie, me and Blake talk a little bit about it. Give me a, give me a thought on offense. Tell me on offense what you'd like to see Alabama do. And it's okay if it's something Charlie said because he took the low-hanging fruit uh, <laughs> with, Jay, with Jalen running the ball. But give us some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think Jalen running the ball is kind of an obvious thing that, you know, Alabama had a lot of success with that early this year. You're coming off a of bye week. Jalen's probably feeling a little – better you know some rest after after eight tough games so i think you'll see a healthier more vibrant dynamic jalen him running the ball but i think running the ball you know you also ran it well with jam and justice in the last game you know so you're coming off a performance where you actually ran the ball pretty well running the ball is going to benefit you in so many ways in this game tim namely it keeps garrett nussmeyer and lsu's offense off the field and uh, gives a defense a break so I like the idea of running the ball with Jalen, with the backs. This LSU defense is good. They're better, much better than they were a year ago, but still not great. If you look at the statistics, Tim, I mean, Missouri's defense statistically is better than LSU's. Now, LSU's got a few more dudes. You're playing in Baton Rouge. I don't expect the sledding to be easy. But I do think the opportunity is there to have some success on the ground, spearheaded by Jalen, but also with Jam and Justice to just benefit the game all the way around. You know, I think going back to that whole Jalen injured debate, I don't I really don't think it's debatable. In my opinion, what I said, I think it was the honest truth is that he was banged up. South Carolina is a now you didn't know it then, but we damn sure know it now is a very physical defense. And they hit him a lot in that game. He got hit a lot. And not saying you get tired legs, you get bruised legs. I don't know if anybody's ever been frogged or whatever you want to call it on the thigh, but that thing doesn't go away quick. And he took a lot of helmets on that thigh area that day. He took a lot of physicality. Um, Jamie, let's talk a little bit. We're old. We're old, guys. We're we're cracked over 100 at this age. We are. You got the top gray. I got the bottom gray. We put together. (laughs) We're just one gray old man. But We're very gray. Yeah, give me a give me a what when I, if I say Jimmy, what jumps out with this Alabama LSU series? What what what's the play? What's the game that stands out to you right out of the gate? I mean, you know, when you phrase it like that, I mean, what what first leaps to mind was I think it was 2012, the swing pass from AJ McCarron to TJ yeah. Eldon. Uh, that that game was so big in terms of launching Alabama to a national championship. Winning down there was always tough. Let's remember that game was just one year removed from the quote game of the century. And and it really, that 2011 Alabama LSU series, I think, should live in college football history. For some reason, it yeah. bored America because there wasn't a lot of points, I guess. No, but the it, was... Dude, it was a dude palooza when Alabama played LSU in 2011. So you're just one year removed from that. Playing in their place 
it was a tough game to win, and Alabama pulled it out at the end with that great play from AJ McCarron to the to the freshman who uh, who scored. I remember Phil Savage uh, not waiting for Eli Gold to make the touchdown call. Phil was so uh, excited in in the booth, but uh, now I, that's what immediately leaps to mind for me. But there's so many Tim. This is a long series, oh, yeah. a great series. So. There's many moments. Everyone's going to have a different one. When I still watch the screenplay, you know, TJ had that get over his skates vibe when he ran sometimes. He just fought. It was like his top his top was heavier than his bottom. When he was tippy-toeing <laughs> with those short steps through there, I mean, it was – I watched it yesterday. We linked it. We had that discussion on the roundtable. It's still worried he's going to – he had those choppy steps, those choppy strides, but, man, those feet were moving. You know, he was getting through there. Then AJ's reaction, you know, at the end of the game. And, you know – we I say this all the time because fans, some fans are really jaded with the NIL and it doesn't matter. Bullshit, it does matter. It does matter. You go back to that fourth down against Missouri, it does matter to these guys. Yes, they have other occupations. They have, I mean other hobbies. They they do podcasts or they do what that it's a different generation. These guys play video games for hours. Not a whole lot of difference, but the emotions in that from AJ, who was a pretty stoic guy, you know, AJ didn't really leave a lot out there. I mean, he didn't even react when Saban spanked the crap out of him, Jimmy. <laughs> AJ, uh, you know, he was he was Saban's quarterback. I mean, it was, AJ, AJ was a passionate guy. I mean, I think this I think AJ is a gunslinger by, by nature Absolutely. And, a pa- and a passionate guy. But he took to Nick Saban's coaching. I think Saban coached him into being a different guy he altogether. Did. I think Saban yeah. coached his personality down to fit what Nick wanted. And uh, he hey, did. make no make no mistake about it. Nick Saban loved AJ McCarron as his quarterback. Now the game changed. Saban changed. The offense changed. Maybe AJ wouldn't have done what Tua did or what Bryce Young did, but AJ was a perfect quarterback for the time at Alabama. And uh, he played the position really well. And uh, the, that LSU game, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's asked about it all the time. Uh, that was spectacular. AJ wasn't even a senior then. That was AJ's red shirt AJ, junior, junior year. He did not lack for confidence. I remember before his oh. senior year, he called and told me he might move to Viger. You know, he was going to go over there and play with those guys. You know, St. Paul, his high school team was slap loaded. AJ yeah. was a junior when a lot of those guys were seniors, including Mark Barron and Destin Hood, who people don't talk about, who, but who was phenomenal. Yeah. Ivan Matchett. And all those guys. Um, Jimmy, I think my most surreal moment is Smitty going gonzo, going crazy. <laughs> and there was no fans at that game. I can't get yeah. over where the hell were all the fans. I still don't know. Where were all the fans? His dad was there. And there's like a famous photo of Devontae making this unbelievable catch in the end zone. And you can see his dad in the stands behind That's him right. in, in the photo. Yeah, 2020, yeah. I mean, I... I I want to say it's my favorite. That's the best Saban team. That was the best Saban team. It is a tragedy that so few people got to see them play in person because of 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 the COVID and and smaller crowds in the stadiums. Yeah. Gosh, what a team! That that was the Nick Saban football team uh, of of his era. You know, a memory nobody's really talked about is when Franchoni went down there and beat Saban. You remember that? I was, heated, there. I was there. Yeah. What I year? What game. year was that? Because remember it was, that? Oh uh, two. Remember that was the whole Saban said something negative about Bama's team. Yeah. And Franchoni's out there giving him the it. business, and obviously, I don't think Nick Saban said it because he was totally no. like, "What are you talking about?" And yeah. again, if you think Nick Saban didn't follow social social media. His last few years, imagine him back when he was at LSU. Right. He didn't even know my face. No, I don't no. For one second he said that stuff, but boy, Fran got his team believing it. And hey, whatever worked. Alabama, I think, won that game something like 31 to nothing. That's what was- I'm remembering. Now, we're all, again, we, as noted, we're old. It could have been 17 to three, but I do think it was 31. <laughs> I do think, I think it, was it was 31, 31 to nothing. But Shawed, it was just Fran- Shawed Williams on the smoke draw. Yeah. Nick Saban and his defensive wizardry just could not stop it. Yeah, that was a that was a weird. No one's even mentioned that. I haven't mentioned it either, though. Uh, Jimmy, excited about basketball last night? I know, I know how subdued you are. We got to pull your emotions out of you at times. But did you did you enjoy that game last night? Oh, definitely. You know, really, it was just sort of uh, I think the validation of the off season hype 
Now you just beat UNC Asheville. You didn't, and who's who's pretty good by the way. And they're not terrible for a mid major at all. Uh, but you can't overreact based on opponent. But what you can react to is there's crazy amount of hype about how good this team could be, and they did nothing to quell that last night. They only poured gas on it. Uh, I love the depth of the team, Tim. Uh, uh, there will be SEC games in which Alabama's bench outperforms the other team's starters. I know that sounds nuts, but I 100% believe it. The depth of this team, six, player 6 through 10, whoever that is, because that's just up for debate who player 6 through 10 are, but player 6 through 10 are good enough to beat SEC teams. Th th this is a, a fantastic, fantastically depth uh, drenched team, especially considering that you're redshirting talented guys like Houston Millett and Nas Cunningham. Those guys could be helping you win games, but they need red shirt year, red shirt years. It benefits them. It benefits the program. Alabama still with unbelievable depth with only 10 guys. I can tell how good a team is based on my friends' reactions where they're like, you got to make the bounce pass there. When they're given this kind of weak criteria, <laughs> I know they're playing because I've got friends that are just always going to say, you know, third and one, sneak the quarterback. And then if you sneak the quarterback, they're like, why don't you roll them out? So, I, you know, I love my friends, especially my basketball <laughs> friends who are very passionate. Jimmy's one of them. But last night they're like, you can't throw that across the court. You got to bounce pass. And I'm like, I know we're good because you're saying that. You're saying that right now. Jimmy, you know what's crazy is how much good basketball. We saw a bunch of good teams last night, um, a bunch of good teams coming up. Auburn is about to have a tough schedule. They're about to go to – I mean, Houston, they're going to Houston. We got big games coming up. And all of this – I'm irritated Auburn's playing Houston in basketball in the middle of the Bama LSU game. I just – you know, I just feel like you could have put that game on. I mean, they don't plan the schedule around me, but they probably ought to. I'm, I'm one of their I'm one of their main viewers, but what are you looking what are you looking forward to from this basketball team as we start working slowly into the uh, the the tough part of the schedule? Well, one thing they didn't do last night, and it was intentional, nor was it necessary, but uh, they didn't shoot a high volume of threes. I mean, I think most nights in the competitive games you're going to see more threes. I think they shot a total of eighteen, which which isn't you know six. I mean, eighteen is is a, quite a few three-pointers, but I think this team's going to be more aggressive in terms of the three-point shooting uh, because they can rebound under the basket. I think having these two centers or two rim protectors in Cliff Amore and Aiden Shirell, uh I, I couldn't have been more impressed with Shirell. I mean, I knew Amore. We, we've seen him play Big Ten games. I mean, I knew he would be good. Shirell is ahead of his time. That's a guy I'm sure... NBA scouts and attendance at the games this year are going to be like, wow, look at that dude. Uh, but I think having those two rim protectors and, and two guys that you can just plan under the basket while you rain threes, I, I love that combination. I think that's what we're going to see when, when the games are, are against uh, more competitive teams. Jimmy, before we get into college football, let me read the second half of our Whataburger ad. Jimmy's a fan, as am I. Oh, Whataburger, yeah. Whataburger here for a, here with a word for all football fans in the audience. If you're tailgating at the LSU versus Alabama game on November 9th, we'll be there serving up hot and fresh Whataburger for you and your crew. So make sure to take an important detour on your way in and on your way to the win. And remember, your local Whataburger's already ready to feed the team, made to order, 100% fresh, served hot 24-7. That's the easiest win you'll get all season. Now, Jimmy Stein, college football, I mean, we talked about this. I, last year's when it really hit me, but this year more so than ever. Any given Saturday, I mean, Florida was giving Georgia the business. You know what I mean? Georgia, and even without Lagway, that was a very competitive game. Um, we're seeing that week in and week out. I mean, you look at some top five, top ten teams, and you know, like I don't feel Penn State's a top ten team when I when I compare them to just the SEC. I feel like you know several SEC teams would have a chance to beat Penn State, LSU, Bama, you know Georgia. I'm forgetting some Tennessee, Tennessee, Texas, Texas. Texas yeah, though, I mean, there's plenty. You know, a lot of teams, and they're they were ranked like what the like third or fourth in the country going into that game or something. Um, but we're seeing this every week. Ranked teams are falling off. The teams we thought we knew, we didn't know. South Carolina is obviously a good team. Uh, Vanderbilt's going to be in the playoffs. I'm not saying Bama should lose to any of these teams, but they're better than you thought. It's not, you know, it's not our 
our teenage Vanderbilt games that we were watching. But excited for this upcoming week. We got Alabama, but we also got a massive game, Georgia and Ole Miss. It's really, I mean, Lane Kiffin's fighting for his playoff life, heavily invested in that uh, NIL for that team. I mean, that's a huge game. It is. Uh, man, it's crazy that Ole Miss could have a third loss and basically be out, or Georgia could have a second loss and then kind of have one foot in and one foot out. I mean, uh, whoever loses this game, there's going to be some level of overreaction to that in terms of us. You know, the, the loser is not going to have a good Saturday evening or Sunday. And, and where, where you're coming off is, you know, the past month, you're like, well, Georgia's going to win that game. Well, look at last Saturday. Ole Miss played maybe its game of the year and destroying an Arkansas team that I thought was going to be competitive with them for 60 minutes. It was nothing like that. And Ole Miss played probably its best game of the year. Georgia, a real questionable performance against a team that's very likely to finish with a losing SEC record in Florida. Uh, so you kind of have to like Ole Miss's momentum and they're playing at home and fighting for their lives. That's going to be a fantastic game and for us Alabama fans, the appetizer uh, leading into the entree with uh, with Ole Miss and Georgia kicking off at 2.30 and Alabama to follow. I tell you, the worst thing that could possibly happen to Ole Miss is people start saying Ole Miss has a chance because f- Georgia has a habit of snuff that that turns into a snuff film. When you think when you think Georgia's back is against the wall, when you think Kirby Smart can use that momentum as well as any coach in college football today, and um, and there will be people talking up Ole Miss. You know, I mean, again, Georgia hasn't lost a regular season game to anybody not named Alabama. I think it's their forty eight no is the gift. It changes uh, since they've lost to somebody. This is a huge game, obviously, for Ole Miss. Um, Jimmy, excitement level for this game this week, because here's my stand, here's my take on this, is we're about to know a thousand percent what the Bama team is. We're about to know a thousand percent. Still football to be played, but win this game, you're a legitimate college football playoff contender um, to get in the playoffs. And if you lose, it's a rebuilding year. You know, you're looking at three losses, trying to sign a top three class and rebuilding by Alabama's definition, not rebuilding by the rest of the nation's. Yeah, I mean, this game tells the tale, and and it tells you whether you're worthy to make the playoff. I mean, if you're going to be in the playoff, you got to win more than one big game. And and sure, Alabama beat Georgia, and that's massive. I mean, that's going to carry a lot of weight all the way through any committee discussion. But you have to add to that. I mean, right now, Alabama's second best win is Missouri, South Carolina, I South Carolina. I think South, South Carolina. Carolina is. Yeah, I think they're okay. striding out at the right time. Sure, but they're likely to finish at best nine and three. Oh, yeah. Maybe, oh, yeah, maybe, yeah, more, yeah. maybe more like eight and four. So you've got to win a game like this to prove that you're one of the 11 best teams. And I say 11 because we know a 12th team will be group of five. So to prove you're one of the 11 best power four teams, you've got to win this game. And if you don't win this game, then it's fair to say, you, you know, you're probably not one of the 11 best teams, which is a lot for Alabama fans to swallow based on what's happened over the past 17 years to all of a sudden not be one of the 11 best teams. That's what's on the line to me, Tim, is sort of a, hey, is this train going to keep on rolling? Or has there been a clear step back and now it's up to DeBoer and his staff to get it moving again? But if you win this game, boy, now you're in pretty good shape to make the playoff. And this Alabama team in the playoff, get them healthy, get them rested, get Ryan Williams turn him from a freshman into a veteran player like he would be in the playoffs. This Alabama team would be dangerous once uh once late December rolls around. It'll it, it might make people mad, but nine and three in a top three recruiting class wouldn't be the worst catastrophe because I don't care. Okay. I mean, we're in the moment now, but I know we did not expect nine and three in a top three class the year after Nick Saban. Um, also the recruiting, I think this staff's done a good job in the portal, and the I still think Alabama is an attractive portal destination. And, uh, you know, to me, I mean, you know, the, the, the discussions going on and I'm not going to get any names and it's not all Alabama related, but the factual, this guy's going in the portal and he's going here that we hear is amazing. Considering we're, we're, in the middle the of the, we're in the middle of the football season. You know <laughs> what I mean? But I mean, it doesn't take long. I mean, I'll never, I'll go back to this before I let you go, Jimmy. I had an NFL coach coach forever in the NFL. When they, when he saw the portal rules, he said, sure made made things easier for these kids to quit. And he's right, because you don't play the first three games, you're pissed off, 
you know, and you take off. Well, Jimmy Stein, love having you on the show. Jimmy Stein, you can catch him at BamOnline.com on the roundtable. Um, Jimmy, Charlie Potter, and Blake Byler will be doing our team preview. It's a good watch. You guys, please check in later in the week. And Jimmy Stein, we will be seeing you for the post-game show on Saturday. See you then, buddy. All right, man. Hey, <laughs> Joe, look at you grinning. So look how happy he is to see me. This is my best friend right here. What's up, Joseph Hastings? What's going on, Tim? How you doing? Joe just knows I can't yell at him because everybody's watching. He's like, aha, I can say what I want. Go Cowboys. You know. <laughs> What's up, Joseph? How was that off week? Yeah, the off week was great. You know, I'm being able to, uh, you know, catch up, see where Alabama was going on the road and uh, watch sa a Saturday that was a little bit stress-free. No, yeah. no Alabama playing. Um, so we got to watch some of those other college football games. And, look, I, I know we put so much, obviously, you know, Alabama fans, we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna watch what Alabama does with intense scrutiny. But think about Georgia, number two team in the country, and your quarterback has three games with three interceptions this season, and another one with two picks. You know, th three straight multi multiple interception games. Like, you know, th th there's a lot of problems with each of these teams outside of Oregon. No, no team has really been perfect this season for the most part. You know, and Ohio State had a really good chance, and Boise State had a good chance to beat Oregon. I just think we're at the stage. No one's walking through a season anymore. You know what I mean? What's going to mm -hmm. separate good from great is the ones who find figure out how to beat Boise State. You know what I mean? That's going to be figure out how to win that game. Because you're right. We were talking about this earlier. Florida was giving Georgia the business. And it would it didn't just end when Lagway went out. Because that's when you're like, okay, this is over. No, they were in this game a pretty good bit. And they were playing the third team. I didn't even, I had to look his name up on, on three. I didn't even know who he was. That's the, the third team uh, quarterback when he came in. Yeah. W w without Mertz, without Lagway, they, they still, yeah. it was still what a 2020 game and, you know, they were right in it. You know, e every single team this season has looked very beatable, Um, you know, and obviously Alabama, you know, they, they lost those two close games, but they, they were two close games. They, they weren't, they weren't blown out. They, um, you know, they, they've got some issues that, 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 that they've needed to correct. And, um, they've been able to address them, especially in that Missouri game. So, um, you know, got that bye week under them and big game coming up this weekend. All right. You mentioned <clears throat> Alabama coaches on the road. Um, I think we're going to start with Courtney Morgan, the GM, going out to see Jackson Lloyd. <laughs> I mean, this guy, I'm telling you, this guy turning his attention to football has as much upside, I think, as any offensive lineman I've seen Alabama sign ever. I mean, the fact that he was 280, he's now 300, 305 pounds, focusing on football, not the, not the highest level uh, that he's playing against, but all the tools you look for in an offensive lineman, he's a little bit nasty, you know, which you want in an offensive lineman. You want him finishing the blocks and everything. But Courtney went out and saw Jackson, probably a guy we don't talk about it. Well, I talk about him a lot, but I don't give y'all a chance. So tell us a little bit about Jackson and where the other Bama coaches went, Joe. Yeah, you know, Jackson's dad, uh, during their official visit in June, he sent me a picture of, of Jackson next to Coach DeBoer, and, and, and it was kind of shocking that this was somebody who was in basketball season at the time, just coming off baseball season, and, um, you know, just, you know, in the shape that he was in. I got a chance to talk with his head coach ahead of the season, and he told me that Jackson was in the best shape that he's ever been in in his life, and he's shown that throughout the year, playing both along the offensive line and defensive line, uh, batting down passes, uh, recording sacks. And just a huge pickup and great evaluation by that Bama staff, um, not, not just earlier this year when they offered him, but going back to Washington when he was a three-star recruit and under the radar, they were like his fifth offer at the time back last June. So, um, you know, C Courtney Morgan saw him. Not too much of a surprise. I mean, Courtney Morgan was the one who delivered the offer earlier this year, a few days after arriving at Bama. Um, they've got a great relationship with him. And Courtney's been pretty much everywhere uh, th this fall. You know, he's been across the country. You know, you, you've done a really good job of keeping tabs on that and, um, and and reporting his whereabouts. I mean, he's been in, you know, Florida, Tennessee. Um, he's been out, out on the West Coast. Um, you know, st stopped by Nevada to see Jet Washington, the highly coveted 2026 defensive back. So Courtney's been putting in the miles this fall. This is another three-star evaluation that Alabama had. I mean, when you look back, I mean, and and it gets the lines get a little bit crossed because some of them rose in the rankings. But Keelan Russell was committed considered just an SMU commit. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackson Lloyd was a guy nobody knew about. Now he was one of the first names we heard when uh, when Kalen DeBoer and Courtney Morgan 
a ride, but also another one that came on back when I saw was Luke Metz, who we had some opinionated people saying he wasn't an SEC talent. And next thing you know, he's got Oregon, he's got Georgia, he's got plenty of schools, not just recruiting him, but pushing hard, trying to get him, I mean, get him on officials, trying to, you know, flip his commitment from Alabama. It's funny, at the time he committed to to Alabama, he had Oklahoma, he had Tennessee, he had Ole Miss, he had, he had some noteworthy offers on the table, and and then he saw Georgia dip into the mix a couple of months later after he committed to Alabama um, or Oregon a few weeks ago, like you mentioned. You know, and, and he's shown it this season, not, not just on, on defense. He's recorded, I believe, nearly nearly 70 tackles already, uh, but also on offense. Um, he, he's got a, a few receiving and rushing touchdowns as well, pretty versatile. And he plays for Mill Creek High School. Um, and, you know, I've had an opportunity to stop by Mill Creek a few times in the past. You know, that, that that's a powerhouse program in the state of Georgia, and they go up against good competition. They recently played Buford High School, obviously a program that's well-known there and in, um, in, in Georgia. So he's going up against top – you know, top talent every single week. And, and, you know, Alabama, once again, a three-star valuation, really good job there early on in the process of of getting on him. Yeah, so Bama got a 2026 commitment. Now, this guy checks a lot of boxes for the BOL roundtable, right? And, again, you can catch us there, Bama Online, running chats. Andrew Bone is not with us today. He had a previous engagement, but he will be back later in the week for our recruiting show. Um, also, you can look for all of us on the Bama post game show. And as mentioned early, earlier, uh, you will have uh, a preview show later in the week. But um, Vodney Cleveland, he checks us some box. He's in the state. He's in a position, defensive line that people love. So having him commit, commit rather early with a lot of attention, went kind of quiet, was a quiet recruitment as far as Bama was concerned. And then they got him on campus and things really began to pick up. And, and not just a defensive lineman, one of the top defensive linemen in the 2026 class, because, you know, that's been a talking point, too. You know, you have London Simmons in this 2025 group, and you know he's been super productive and all that. The, the rankings don't match necessarily that production and the evaluation that Alabama ha- had. But, you know, London Simmons is an exciting player, um, you know, for, for going forward, projecting in the future. And um, you look at Vaughn Cleveland, the same, you know, six foot two and a half, 305 pounds. He, um, you know, that's not a fake 305 pound number, by the way. If you watch his training videos and and everything that he's put out, or just watch his film. You know, he he's got that size, uh, really explosive off the line of scrimmage. You know, your prototypical, you know, no, nose tackle type defensive lineman. He's gonna generate push. He's gonna um, be able to make plays, shed blocks. Um, you know, make tackles in the run game. I thought was, you know, when when you watch his junior season film, what what really stood out is a lot of those clips were against Carrollton High School. Uh, which is which went undefeated. Obviously, has Alabama commit Dorian Barney. Um, so that, that that's a high level program right there. And he was making plays against them all night long. Uh, that game was on ESPN too. So um, you know, just a really exciting player out of Parker High School, transferred from from Prattville. He um, you know he, he he's got a lot of potential at the next level. He's he's still gonna you know still got a senior year to develop. You always mention about defensive lineman being a developmental position. I mean, he looks like he can step right into a college football program right now with with the size that he's at. So um, very exciting prospect. Yeah. A guy you had an interview with, which is another favorite. I mean, the, the, to me, Justin Hill, I mean, there's so many things to like for Alabama fans to like about it. First of all, he's supposedly Ohio state lock. I mean, that was it. Everybody was saying, but we were saying on BOL, not so fast, you know, might want to slow down. We knew obviously the mom was a huge Bama fan. We knew Alabama was definitely in the mix for him. Probably hasn't gotten enough love. His team is fun to watch, but Justin does some special things. Christian Robinson did a great job. Now, going into this class, Alabama wanted to sign a Wolf, one Wolf, and if they could get a second, that would be good. They got Dawson Dawson Merritt in that second. But getting Justin Hill, who to me is one of the most elite linebackers in the country, was so big, and to pull him out of Ohio State. You're, you're going to give me grief for this one here. But before the interview started with Justin, I was like, man, watching your game, because we were talking about um, Sunday NFL football. Um, I was like, watching your game, man, you, you kind of remind me of Michael Parsons a little bit, just in terms of how versatile you are and you know how you can kind of line up at different positions and make an impact pretty much everywhere. And he's like, that, that's the guy in the NFL that I model my game after. And, and when you turn on the tape, you know, you, you see somebody who can you know, go off the edge, you know, has elite, has elite burst, um, you know, re- uses really good speed to power. Um, you know, he can drop back into coverage if he needs to play a little bit of that off-ball linebacker. Um, when Woods kind of uses him a little bit everywhere, but, you know, had a, had a chance to catch up with him. He visited for the Missouri game, second time visiting Alabama this season. Um, you know, plans on returning for the Iron Bowl as well. 
locked in, hasn't been taking visits elsewhere, doesn't plan on taking visits elsewhere. And, you know, it's just feeling continues to feel really great about his his commitment status. And you mentioned Christian Robinson. He, he's um, you know playing a really big role there. The relationships that he built not only with Justin Hill and his mom, but just the entire Winton Woods community. And I talked with um, the, the head coach, Chad Murphy, a few weeks ago. And he talked about Robinson, how he's a great guy, got to meet him during his stop back in September. Um, you know, Robinson is just making a really strong impression, not only in this 2025 class, not only 2026, but also 2027, adding a couple commits there too. So, um, you know, future seems pretty bright at that wolf position. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that gets lost in recruiting. Everybody's so worried about the ones who aren't locked in. And I get that's kind of human nature, but I mean, I've always been. This isn't an old man thing. This is I've always just worried about the ones who wanted to come, you're not the ones who didn't want to come. And <clears throat> there's a lot of Bama guys just in general talk about recruiting who are locked in, who've been <clears throat> good recruits who committed and did the right thing. So there's always going to be some that want to take visits and do all that stuff. And, you know, you have to ride that wave out. And again, I think the portal, <clears throat> and I said this with Jimmy, I think it changes everything because you don't necessarily need a prep guy to be good. Jeremy Bernard, you know, is an excellent wide receiver for Alabama. Parker Brailsford is a really good center. I think Alabama is a popular destination to look at. Not that they're going to get everybody, but they're going to have guys that definitely they're going to that's going to look at Alabama as a uh, a team to go to. So that changes a lot of the dynamics of recruiting. But again, I think we worry about the ones we meaning not me, but y'all, but we worry. No, I, I had to follow it too. But the ones you worry about the ones that might not come instead of kind of appreciating the ones that do come. Justin's been very quiet, you know, up to this point, there's been others. Um, but again, the commitment, how that, that went down with him and extreme talent he's getting, is fantastic. Now, Alabama's kind of, you know, sitting where they're sitting, a lot of guys being recruited to go mm -hmm. to other schools trying to flip. Bama's trying to flip a few. We're going to get into a lot of these guys later in the week in the recruiting show. But Donovan Starr committed to Auburn. Ivan Taylor committed to Michigan are a couple of guys. But there's other guys that we're not probably talking about that Alabama's recruiting quietly because nobody really knew about Donovan Starr until they knew about it. Exactly. And look, I, I know – you know, people see Caleb Cunningham visiting Ole Miss. They see Dijon Lee visiting Georgia last month. And, you know, there's a lot of concern there. But ju just as Alabama is seeing their commits take visits elsewhere, Alabama is also bringing in prospects committed elsewhere on their campus, too. So recruiting kind of gives and takes um, in, in that sense, you know. And, you know, they've done a really good job with re recruiting Donovan Starr to this point, got him on campus for an official visit. He's considering a return trip. Um, you know, Bama is one of those schools in consideration. Georgia just recently offered him. Uh, you, you see those recruitments, right, uh, Tim? You've seen them throughout the years where in the senior year, they just blow up and, you know, top schools go after them. Joseph Mbachu, defensive lineman out of Grayson High School in Georgia, is another one, too, where, you know, you you, you think it's heading one way at, at, at one point in the summer. They're committed to a program and then they get a whole um, influx of offers. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how things play out. Obviously, a lot, lot less time this recruiting cycle than in years prior because before, you know, you still had those – a uh, few weeks after the season ended, the regular season ended to get some guys on campus for official visits. The one kind of stands out to me is, you know, Kevin Riley last year who took his uh, a mid-December official visit to Alabama. And that, that kind of swung things. You have less time now with it being December 4th. And then obviously some guys may opt to sign in February. So we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, and we're going to see not only the, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people think the game's over with this early signing period. And I keep saying, no, no, no. That's mm -hmm. like halftime. You know, you got the late signing period. You've got portal. I don't even know how many portal windows you're going to have because every college coach that leaves is a new portal window for that school. So you're going to have portal windows. Um, you're going to have people that want to move and everything else going on. I have no doubt. You know, you get in that top to basically when you look at the top five recruiting classes in the country, all of them are really good. There's a guy separating one from three and three from five. You know, there's a guy or two separating it based on that, but they're really good. But to be in a position to even come you know to land the number one class i don't think you can really fault how this staff did it and they did it honestly in their first year at alabama they haven't even been here a year yet they haven't even I been here it's been like 10 months i didn't expect it i i thought maybe maybe top five that's kind of what i've been saying i always thought it was going to be kind of you know in that four to six range uh i did not expect number one class at, at this stage and um and it's just a testament to that Alabama staff with the evaluations they've done. Cause you know, part of that is, you know, you have somebody like a Jackson Lloyd who wasn't, you know, highly rated before Bama still pursued heavily. 
you know, one of the top offensive linemen in the country. Uh, other guys that they jumped into the mix early on for, like a Dijon Lee, he was one. Of, he was offered, I believe, a day after Jackson Lloyd was. Uh, the staff did a really good job on, on you know, kind of a, a whim's notice, being able to, you know, land a Ryan Williams, you know, land a Noah Carter, um, you know, go after those 2025 guys when they needed to, even when you lost most of that 2025 class following Coach Saban's retirement to do their um, their own evaluations. I think it was exceptional. They did a really good job. Now you didn't, y'all didn't expect it, but I figured Alabama. I told you mid, you know, mid November, Bama would be in a chance to finish the number one class. I yep. told you that. I did not tell you that, Joseph. No, I no, love he, that you he just. He, he texted me. He texted me. That I have the text. Joseph's just trying to keep me to keep from yelling at him about Micah Parsons, who is an elite football player at every, every every level. I couldn't get mad about that. Well, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Joseph Hastings will have more for you on the recruiting front later this week. We're going to do a recruiting show. We'll have Andrew Bone back, and we'll have Joseph Hastings, obviously. We'll be covering some recruiting. You can find us at BamaOnline.com. A lot going on. Basketball started. Uh, LSU week, you know, put up or shut up. We got a lot going on right now, and you can talk about it all on the roundtable. Joseph Hastings, wish them a do. Thank you all for tuning in. Give us a like and subscribe, and we'll, we'll see you all later this week. See you, guys and girls. Thank you.